Our lives are filled with distractions. Email, Twitter, texting. We're constantly connected to technology, rarely alone with just our thoughts. Which is probably why there's a growing movement in America to train people to get around the stresses of daily life. It's a practice called mindfulness, and it basically means being aware of your thoughts, physical sensations, and surroundings. Tonight, we'll introduce you to the man who's largely responsible for mindfulness gaining traction. His name is John Kabat-Zinn, and he thinks mindfulness is the answer for people who are so overwhelmed by life, they feel they aren't really living at all. There are a lot of different ways to talk about mindfulness, but what it really means is uh, awareness. Is it being present? It is being present. That's exactly what it is. I don't feel I'm very present in each moment. I feel like every moment I'm either thinking about something that's coming down the road or something that's been in the past. So ultimately, all this preparing is for what? For the next moment, like the last moment, like, and then we're dead. So in a certain way, <laughs> are we depressing. going to experience while we're still alive? We're only alive now. John Kabat-Zinn is an MIT-trained scientist who's been practicing mindfulness for 47 years. Back in 1979, he started teaching mindfulness through meditation to people suffering from chronic pain and illness. That program is now used in more than 700 hospitals worldwide. So how can you be mindful in your daily life? When your alarm goes off and you jump out of bed, what is the nature of the mind in that moment? Are you already like, oh my God, your calendar pops into your mind and you're driven already? Or can you take a moment and just lie in bed and just feel your body breathing and remember, oh yeah, brand new day and I'm still alive. So I get out of bed with awareness, brush my teeth with awareness. When you're in the shower next time, check and see if you're in the shower. <laughs> what do you mean check and see if you're in the shower? Well, you may not be. You may be in your first meeting at work. You may have 50 people in the shower with you. Kapit Zinn says mindfulness takes practice. A lot of people start with a training class to learn how to meditate. He agreed to teach us at a weekend retreat on a remote mountaintop in Northern California. When we arrived, we were told there'd be no television to watch, no internet, not even an alarm clock. So I'm checking in. The retreat was full of professionals, neuroscientists, business leaders, Silicon Valley executives. Before we began, we all had to surrender our last ties to the outside world. Put your devices in the basket, you know. I'm contributing my MacBook Air and my uh, iPhone, happily. <laughs> I wasn't exactly happy to give up my phone. I usually check email several times an hour. So let's take a few minutes and just settle into a, an erect and dignified posture. The retreat lasted three days, and most of that time was spent just sitting there, silently meditating, with occasional guidance from Kabat-Zinn. There's no place to go. There's nothing to do. We're just asking you to sit and know that you're sitting. Knowing that you're sitting may sound simple. Turns out it's not. The mind constantly wanders. The mind has a life of its own. It goes here and there. To not get lost in thought, Kabat-Zinn recommended focusing on the sensation of breathing in and out. Can we actually ride with full awareness on the Waves of the breath at the belly, at the nostrils, in the chest, and then simply rest here in awareness. Resting in awareness is one of those phrases used a lot by people who practice mindfulness. But when I tried to do it, it wasn't restful, and I worried I wasn't doing it right. I kept thinking about work. I miss my cell phone. <laughs> You're not alone. Having a little withdrawal, I will say. <laughs> Kabat-Zinn, who's written 10 books on mindfulness and led nearly 100 retreats, describes meditation as a mental workout. The mind wanders away from the breath, and then you gently and non-judgmentally just bring it back. So it's okay that the mind drifts away, but you just bring it back? It's the nature of the mind to drift away. The mind is like the Pacific Ocean. It waves. And mindfulness has been shown to drop underneath the waves. If you drop underneath the agitation in the mind into your breath deep enough, calmness, gentle undulations. After hours of meditating and 30-minute sessions, it does get easier. Those waves of thought Kabat-Zinn described, they're still there, 
but you get less distracted by them. At breakfast, we spent time relearning some of the very basic things in life, including how to eat food. Eating a meal in complete silence is a little awkward, but without conversation as a distraction, you taste more and eat less. This is something called walking meditation. The goal is to learn to be aware of each and every movement and feeling. I know it seems ridiculous, but it does change the way you experience walking. The Zen people from ancient China, when you're walking, just walk. Turns out to be the hardest thing. <laughs> That's when an ancient you're walking, saying. Just walk. When you're eating, just eat. Not from the TV, not with the newspaper. Turns out that's huge. Congressman Tim Ryan, an Ohio Democrat, says mindfulness might look a lot like nothing, but he really believes it can change America for the better. He attended his first meditation retreat in 2008, just days after winning a grueling re-election campaign. But being mindful at a retreat is one thing. We wondered if back in Washington, Congressman Ryan ever worries about how all this looks. Well, you know, I can see myself in high school going, whoa, stay away from those guys. So how do you use it here on Capitol Hill? <laughs> I'm on the budget committee, for example. There's a lot of conflict, and people say things that get you ramped up. I find myself, as my body clenches up when somebody says something that I know is wrong or I, I, I want to catch them in a lie or whatever, that just calm down when it's your turn. You make your point. Hey, man. You don't hear the words calm and Congress together very often, but Ryan is trying to change that. He hosts weekly meditation sessions open to members and staff of both parties. Now shifting the attention to take in the entire body. Have you gotten any Republican congressmen in to meditate with you yet? No. <laughs> We're working on it. He's written a book about mindfulness and obtained a million dollars of federal funding to teach it to school children in his Ohio district. I feel like we're calm right now. Yes, you are. <laughs> I've seen it transform classrooms. I've seen it heal veterans. I've seen what it does to individuals who have really high chronic levels of stress and how it has helped their body heal itself. I wouldn't be willing to stick my neck out this far if I didn't think this is the thing that can really help shift the country. To some people, though, this may sound like kind of new age gobbledygook. There are so many different compelling studies that are showing that this is not new age gobbledygook. This is potentially transformative of our health and well-being psychologically as well as physically. It can be useful for anxiety, depression, stress reduction. There have been a number of studies that show mindfulness can lead to those benefits, as well as improvements in memory and attention. And at the University of Massachusetts, Judson Brewer, a psychiatrist and neuroscientist, uses mindfulness to treat addiction. This is just the next generation of exercise. We've got the physical you know, exercise components uh, down, and now it's about working out how can we actually train our minds. Dr. Brewer is trying to understand how mindfulness can alter the functioning of the brain. He uses a cap lined with 128 electrodes. We're going to start filling each of these 128 wells with conduction gel. The electrodes are able to pick up signals from the posterior cingulate, part of a brain network linked to memory and emotion. This is all just picking up electrical signal from the top of your head. Since attending the mindfulness retreat, I'd been meditating daily and was curious to see if it had an impact on my brain. We're going to have you start with thinking of something that was very anxiety provoking for you. Okay. When I thought about something stressful, the cells in my brain's posterior cingulate immediately started firing, shown by the red lines that went off the chart on the computer screen. Just drop into meditation. Okay. When I let go of those stressful thoughts and refocused on my breath, within seconds the brain cells that had been firing quieted down, shown by the blue lines on the computer. That's really fascinating to see like that. Dr. Brewer believes everyone can train their brains to reach that blue mindfulness zone, but he says all the technology we're surrounded by makes it difficult. If you look at people out on the street, if you look at people at restaurants, nobody's having conversations anymore. They're sitting at dinner looking at their phone because their brain is so addicted to it. You really think there's something in the brain that's addicted to that? 
Well, it's the same reward pathways as addiction, absolutely. I'm, you know, on mobile devices all day long, and I feel like I could go through an entire day and not be present. And what's that like? It's exhausting. <laughs> yeah. So all of this is leading to a societal exhaustion. The irony is many of the people responsible for creating the gadgets that distract us are themselves practicing mindfulness. More than 2,000 people from companies like Google, Facebook, and Instagram showed up earlier this year in San Francisco for a mindfulness conference called Wisdom 2.0. Please welcome our guests. Karen May is a Google vice president, and that's Chade Main Tun, a former engineer who's become kind of a mindfulness guru. As could only happen at a place like Google, his actual title is Jolly Good Fellow. Which nobody can deny. <laughs> <laughs> so what does a Jolly Good Fellow do? My job description is to enlighten minds, open hearts, and create world peace. That's your job description? That's my job description. I've heard that at some meetings at Google, you actually start out with moments of silence. We do. How long do you sit there quietly for? It's literally a minute or two of noticing your breathing, calming yourself down, being present, and then you're able to go into the meeting, the business at hand, with a little bit more focus. Does it make people more productive? Yes, it does. When the mind is unagitated, when the mind is calm, that mind is most conducive to creative problem solving. To innovate. Correct, and one of the powers of mindfulness is the ability to get to that frame of mind on demand. So, along with their free health clubs and other company perks, Google now offers their 52,000 employees free lessons in mindfulness. In the middle of stress, in the, when everything's falling apart, you can take one breath. You know, I can imagine some people rolling their eyes and saying, oh, come on, of course, Google, you guys have tons of money, and there's massage therapists walking around, and, and all sorts of nice things for employees, but it just doesn't seem practical. The advantage of this is it actually doesn't cost anything and it doesn't take much time. And you believe it really works? I, I absolutely believe it works. After nearly four decades of teaching mindfulness, John Kabat-Zinn is happy to see it hitting the mainstream. But if you're starting to think mindfulness is something you should start practicing, he says you may be missing the point. It's not a big should. It's not like, oh, I got it. Now one more thing that I have to put in my life. Now I have to be mindful, you know. And if it becomes that one more thing they got to do after they, they take the yoga class. Just don't they... do it. Don't do it. It's not a doing at all, in fact. It's a being, and being doesn't take any time. So I want to talk about practicing presence. Um... One of the most powerful gifts you can give another human being is to be present for them. Imagine your daughter comes into the kitchen all excited to show you her picture and you are on the telephone. You give her a nod and murmur, that's nice honey, but you don't stop your call. Your daughter has gotten the message that she is important. Imagine instead that you end the call and turn to her with interest. Suddenly she feels important. This is giving your presence, your undivided attention. So uh, one of the things I recommend in parenting is actually just setting aside 20 minutes to a half hour of just presence. I'm here for you. I'm listening to what you have to say. I'm not judging. I'm not evaluating. I'm just being present. The essence of being present is what we call mindfulness. Being in this moment. So I want to talk about what does it mean to be be present, to be present. And I, uh, visually, I think of it as like a timeline, with this is the future, and this being the past. And this moment right here, we call now. And there's two ways of thinking about this. One is that now lasts a split second. Because I just said that word and it's already gone. It's no longer in the present. Well, everything that I just said is in the past, correct? Until I say the word now again and now. So now is constantly moving. But in another sense, now is the only time there is. There is no such thing as the past. You can't point to the past. You can't change the past doesn't exist anymore except as a memory. And when is that memory happening? Right now. 
And the same is true of the future. The future doesn't exist. A weatherman can't even accurately predict tomorrow's weather, let alone what's going to happen next Tuesday, or next Thursday, or a, a month from now. It's just too variable. So we can't predict the future. We can't change the past. So we only have one place to really be where we're effective at all, and that's this moment now. So the art of mindfulness is learning a new skill. We've all learned the skill of memory. We've all learned the skill of storing data. We've all learned the skill of tracking. But we haven't learned the skill of letting go and just being present. Imagine that your brain has slots. This is, a, a, this is a fun way for me to discover how the brain works. There's a theory that says your brain has five slots of awareness. And in this moment, they're filled with me standing up here. So you're looking at me up here, and hopefully you're listening to the thoughts that I, the words that I'm saying. Maybe you're taking notes. Maybe you're aware of your sit sitting in the chair. Maybe you are aware of the sound of the air conditioning. But around five, your slots of awareness are full. You can't pay any attention to that. So when somebody walks into the room, for a moment you stop looking at me, and you stop listening to what I'm saying, because your attention is on the other person walking into the room and wondering, huh, something about them. Where were they? Or I hope they didn't miss anything. And then you come back to, oh yeah, wait a minute, I'm, I'm listening to Jim. And what he's saying and how incredibly wise and wonderful it is. And how humble Jim is as a speaker and modest. In fact, that's really my only flaw, is my modesty. Um, so, that makes sense, the idea of that you can pay attention to about five things at one time? So this becomes really interesting because as it turns out, the phenomenon is that if you have most of your slots filled with thoughts about the past, and you're thinking about the past all the time, or primarily, you, you tend to be easily depressed. Because you're thinking about what happened that you didn't do, or what happened that you did do that you shouldn't have done, or what you could have done if you would have. And so the depression is about the past. What do you think happens if all of your attention is on the future? What's going to happen? What ifs? What is that? Anybody? Anxiety. Anxiety, exactly. Anxiety is about the future, forever and always. Why I love this example is because I got stuck wondering how can people be anxious and depressed at the same time? Because anxiety is a kind of a high energizing, the, the blood's flowing, the, the, the thoughts are happening rapidly, and depression is kind of a low energy, sluggishness. But using this model, by having thoughts about the future and the past at the same time, you get anxiety plus depression. So the mind has the ability to do that. How is this helpful? Well, the interesting thing about practicing mindfulness is that it's not a cure for depression and anxiety, but it's a vacation from anxiety by putting your attention on this moment now. If your slots are filled with this moment now, then you're not anxious, you're not depressed. Because you're, you're not anxious because you're not thinking about the future, you're now. You're not depressed because you're not thinking about the past, you're now. So it's a, it's a freedom from anxiety and depression. Still with me, still make sense? Okay, so now the burning question. How do we do that? 
How do we keep our attention on the now? What does that mean? Any ideas? How do we keep our attention on the now? What would be the technique of mindfulness? The technique is using one or more of your five senses. Sight, sound, touch, taste, smell. Because those are happening now. Everything else is thoughts, is memory. So, when I first started learning mindfulness, back in early 70s, 71, 72, one of the first things I learned was a tech, a visual technique, where you stare at a candle flame. And you watch the candle flame flicker. And every time you start thinking about fire, about wax, about where the wax, then you back into thinking, you let it go, and you come back to the moment now. And you watch the candle flame. So that was an early mindfulness technique. Um, and then I moved on, one of my professors was actually teaching a technique called spotting, where you would close your eyes and you would notice the spots in the darkness when your eyes are closed. And you would try to keep the spots from moving. If you, if you looked at a spot, it would move away. So the idea was to relax the eyes and keep the, the spots from moving. Again, a visual technique. And then in 1972, I learned Transcendental Meditation, TM. And that was an auditory technique. That was being given a meaningless word, a mantra, and just quietly, mentally repeating the sound to yourself. What's the mantra? Um, virtually every word you have ever learned has two components. It has the sound, and then it has the meaning. So if I say the word chair, the ear hears ch, eh, air, er, you know, the sounds. And the brain says something to sit in. But imagine a word where you have no meaning. You just have the sound. The example that I love to give is Rus Lapsa. Almost nobody has any idea what the word Rus Lapsa means. There's no meaning. There's just the sound Rus Lapsa. You can invent meanings, but it doesn't have a meaning to you. That would that's kind of the idea of a mantra, is you have a sound with no meaning. So you don't get hooked in the thoughts, you just repeat that sound. By the way, the word Rus Lapsa is from Russian and it means mellow out, or chill. It was one of my favorite words when I was studying Russian. I just say, it was you know, relax. So that was the auditory technique that I learned. In the um, probably mid-80s, a guy by the name of John Kabat-Zinn, a doctor by the name of John Kabat-Zinn, gets into mindfulness, and he's teaching a physiological technique, a tactical sensation, where you're aware of the body breathing. And the idea is you put your attention on the breath. Not that you're controlling or counting your breath so much as you're just aware. Oh, my body just took a deep breath. And an exhale. And an in-breath. And an exhale. So the attention is on the physical sensation of the body. Also a wonderful technique. But my favorite was one that Eckhart Tolle. Now, if you're interested in mindfulness at all, Eckhart Tolle is, wrote the preeminent book on mindfulness. It's called The Power of Now. And it's a really powerful teaching technique. And in uh, his second book, Creating a New Earth, which I believe is on the bookshelf, he taught me a technique that really has worked for me very well, tactile sensation. So I want to share it with you, and we can do it together. So what I'd like to suggest you do is you just hang your hands at your side, rest them on your arms. The idea is put your hands in a position where they're not touching anything. So your hands are hanging free, not touching anything, not moving. Now I want you, to, if, you if you'd like, you can close your eyes or not, but for me it's easier to close my eyes. And ask yourself the question, and I don't need an answer to this, just ask yourself the question, how do I know my hands exist? They're not moving, they're not touching anything. How do I know my hands exist? 
And as you ask yourself that question, you become aware of your hands. Not that they're moving, they're just being hands. Now in the medical profession, they have a name for this, it's called proprioception. And basically it just means body awareness. But for a moment, what I want you to do is just be aware of your hands. Feel the sensation of aliveness in your hands as you're sitting there. For some, it's a tingly sensation. For some, it's a warm, kind of fuzzy feeling. Others have reported kind of the, a pulse, feeling the pulse of the blood in their hands. There's no right or wrong. It's just noticing the sensation of aliveness in your hands. And usually within about 15 seconds, the mind starts off on its trip. This is really kind of cool. Or this is really stupid. Or what? how long is this going to last? And you just notice that you're thinking, and you let the thought go and find your hands again. And feel the aliveness. And up comes another. time is lunch. Is he almost done? And then you notice that you're thinking, you're talking to yourself. You let the thoughts go and you just go back and see if you can find your hands again. Find the feeling of aliveness. Notice that there's judgments, or boredom, or restlessness. Those are all thoughts. And when you notice it, let it go and find your hands again. You don't push thoughts away. You don't fight and resist judgments or talking. You just turn your attention back to finding that feeling. fuzzy sensation of aliveness. And you'll have another thought. Don't beat yourself up. It's not about wrong. Thoughts are a part of the process. And the art of mindfulness is noticing that you're having a thought and then finding your hands again. feeling the aliveness. Listening to the body. And then opening your eyes back. What did you notice? Uh, did you notice lots of thoughts or very few thoughts? Did you notice judgments? What were you aware of in that process? Anybody? Lots of thoughts, right. You won't settle your mind. It's not the purpose of it. The purpose of your mind is just noticing, oh look, lots of thoughts. Find your hands again. Oh, lots of thoughts. Find your hands again, yeah. That's a common mistake that people make, is thinking, well, I should, my mind should get quieter. It kind of depends on the day. What I discovered over my years of meditating was that my morning meditation 
would have less thoughts than my afternoon meditation. And my afternoon meditation was just chaotic, lots of thoughts about the day and about the evening. And it was just the practice of noticing thoughts, letting them go. Noticing thoughts, returning to my mantra, to my breath, to my hands, whatever the, whatever your technique is. And being aware, sometimes you'll get you'll beat up on yourself. Oh, I'm doing this wrong. Probably over the course of 40 years, I've had 15 or 20 times when I thought, ah, I've got it now. I've, all this time I've been doing it wrong and now this is it. It's just another thought. It comes up. And you just, oh, when you notice the thought, you say, oh, and then you go back to your focal point. 